morning. Northview, how y'all doing this morning? morning. It's good to see you. Good to be with you. I want to say a special hello to everybody online who's connecting up with us. We're so grateful uh, that you can be here too. Hey, if you have a Bible with you or Bible app on your phone, open it up to the book of 1 Peter. We're going to kick off a new series today uh, that is going to go through the book of 1 Peter, kind of cover the major themes and message of this book. It's a great book. Like if you don't know this book, you need this book. You need to know this book. If you're a new follower and uh, you're not too familiar with the Bible, this is going to be a powerful book for you to just read and to study and to just bring into your heart. If you've been a follower for a long time, uh, this is one that you got to make sure you know that you're in and that you've uh, that you've uh, continually applied your life. If you're going through hard times, this is a book that you definitely need uh, in your life right now. And, and I say that because the book was written against the backdrop of some really, really difficult circumstances. It's always good to, to know kind of where this letter is coming from, where when we read our Bible, we're reading a book that was written a long, long time ago, but it, but it connects to today. And uh, this one is about faith that is unshakable unshakable. You know, when I think about unshakable faith, uh, I'll tell you, one, one of the guys that I think about is a guy on our staff named Sean, who has been a fan of one of the most pitiful teams in NFL history. And is he not having his moment in the sun right now? He's in the back right now, just grinning ear to ear. I mean, he is living his best life. He's wearing Bengals underwear every day, and he's coming in, just letting us have it. And you know what? We are so happy for him. And uh, how, many, how many of you are rooting for the Bengals to win it all next weekend? A bunch of you? Okay. How, how many of you Rams fans? Okay. And then that just means that there's a rest of you, you must have unshakable faith in your team. They're not in it this year, but you have unshakable faith in your team. How many of you, you say, that's me, and so I'm just watching the game. Yeah, next week, wear your jersey of whatever your team is that you, that you rep for. Uh, I'll be wearing my Bears jersey. I have unshakable faith that they will be as miserable next year as they have been every year <laughs> since 1985, uh, but maybe, maybe not. Brian will be in his cowboy stuff. You know he will be, and uh, we share a, a misery uh, most of the time among staff on our teams, but uh, we're pulling for Sean and, and and for the Bengals to do this. But listen, this book, 1 Peter, man, I mean, it was written in some hard times. Hard times. Let me tell you how hard the times were. Uh, this was like 63, 64 AD. And in that time, there was a guy named Nero who was the emperor of Rome. And you want to talk about somebody who was unhinged? Read your history books. This guy was as awful as they get. And, and this was the stage in which he was probably about as bad as he ever was. I mean, it was just bad, bad, bad. He was always trying to pin his problems on other people, pass the blame specifically to the Christians and try to put blame on them. He, it's believed, was the one who was set the, the city on fire, but he blamed the, the Christians for it. He made life miserable for them. And at this era in history, Christians, people who believed in Jesus and were public publicly declared, I'm a follower of Jesus. They faced state-sponsored terrorism. Think about that for a second. It was the law of the land to terrorize and brutalize Christians. And Nero would go so far, stories are told of him dipping Christians in oil, impaling them and lighting them on fire so he could walk around through his garden and have light at night. He was that bad. It was that dire. And the suffering was that extreme. I mean, you risked your life to be a follower of Jesus in this day and in this moment. These Christians are in like modern day Turkey at that time. And Peter, who was an apostle of Jesus, probably one of the most famous apostles, right? We love to identify with Peter because he, was, he had his highs and his lows. He had his moments of great faith. He had his moments of great failure. And we look at Peter often and go, oh, I feel like that a lot. He went from rejecting Jesus on the night of his crucifixion to, to being a leader in the church and a shepherd and a guide for many followers of Jesus. And he's going to use this opportunity to speak life into a number of Christians and Christian congregations that were scattered all over Asia Minor at that time. Here's the thing about First Peter. Though this time in history was desperate and though the persecution was extreme, what Peter is going to teach the congregations then and us today 
is that even when those times are awful, that God is still good and that there's still opportunity for him to be praised and for us to be firm in our faith, to be firm in our faith. You know, one of the things that I learned uh, from a professor of mine about this book is that in his teaching over the years, decades worth of teaching, that more international students than not, if you ask them what their favorite book of the Bible was, they would say First Peter. Think about that. What's your favorite book of the Bible? There's no wrong answer to it, but he thought it was interesting that of our international students, more of them said First Peter than anything else. Why? Because they experienced much of this difficulty and much of this hardship that maybe we haven't perceived or experienced as much in the United States. But I don't think I'm telling you something you don't know, but it's becoming more costly to be a Christian in America. It is being perceived as more, we are more of a threat than we've ever been perceived before. And that's why I think this message is going to have a lot to say to us in our day about the struggles and battles that we face. First Peter chapter 1 verse 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect exiles, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ, sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Now, this is just his intro, but there's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. But maybe nothing stands out to me more than what he identifies this group of Christians as. He says, you are elect exiles. That's a strange title. You are the elect exiles. Here's what he's doing. He is comparing and contrasting spiritual realities with earthly realities. And from the very beginning of the book, he's helping people to see, you and I to see, spiritual realities are not always congruent with earthly realities. And there is a desire of, for us to often have these together, but they don't always fit together. He says, you are the elect, you are the chosen. Spiritually, you have an identity. You are gods, you have been called out of the world, but you are exiles in this world. In other words, you're homeless. You're chosen by God, but you're homeless. Have you ever felt that to be true? That you don't fit, that your faith doesn't fit in the world that we live in? That the values that Jesus stands for, that he teaches, that the Bible speaks to, do not fit or are not compatible in the society or the world that we're in? It's never, it's, it's always been true that that's the case. It was true 2,000 years ago in these first century churches. So Peter has a message to the elect exiles. And Peter, I mean, poor guy, this, nobody knew misery like Peter. I mean, he's gone from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, right? And I think he wore an extra shame because they, all the disciples faced, they were all hurt deeply when Jesus was crucified, deeply, and they all scattered. But Peter wore the extra shame of denying Jesus so vehemently three times. He was the one who had said, even if everybody runs away from you, Jesus, I would, I'll never do that. And what do we know from the story? All it took was some badgering from a young girl. And he renounced Christ three times. He had that extra despair and that extra shame connected. How does Peter go from that, denying Jesus three times, to being able to stand up in the midst of persecution where Christians were being set on fire for their faith, watched to burn, and say to these congregations, stand strong, hold on, don't lose the faith. How did he go from that Friday experience to this? Well, the resurrection changed everything right? That's his very next verse. Praise be to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. 
This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who are through faith, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in this last time. Notice that at the beginning of this book, a book that's going to be about suffering and endurance and holding on to your faith and and having an unshakable commitment to Jesus, that one of the first prescriptions or one of the first exhortations that Peter gives just three verses in to this book is praise God. Praise God. In fact, what he says sounds very, very familiar to something he would have heard over and over and over again in, his, in the synagogue as a young boy. There was a, a series of 18, it was called the 18 blessings, and they were read morning, noon, and evening every single day in the synagogue, and every single one of them started with, blessed be thou, O God. Peter's reminding his congregations who are listening to this message, that before I tell you anything else, before we talk anything else about what you need to know, he's, he's reminding us that one of the fastest ways when we're in hardship or any time in life in that matter, one of the fastest ways to connect with God is through praise. That in an instant, by directing your eyes upward away from your current circumstances and your current pain, in an instant you can look up to the heavens and you can praise God. And by doing so, you are instantly transported to the throne room of God. Praise can carry you to the throne faster than just about anything. Now, some might ask, how do you praise God when life is so hard, when faith is so difficult? Well, Peter tells us in these verses at least three reasons. For one, he's merciful. He's a merciful God. He doesn't treat us as we deserve. He's merciful. Two, he's given us new birth. Three, that new birth is into a living hope. What's the living hope? What's the inheritance? It's the inheritance that we receive in Christ. And that inheritance is something that, that not only is just um, something that, that we get, that means salvation and all its blessings, but the promise that we get to receive it. We get to receive it. It's a promise that we get to receive all or everything that God has for us. Peter calls this an inheritance that can never spoil perish or fade. Listen, everything on this earth spoils, perishes, or fades. And in case you need this reminder, open up your refrigerator today when you go home and do a sweep of everything in there because stuff spoils, perishes, and fades. Have you ever done that routine check of your refrigerator only to discover this is not just gone, it is gone, gone. Like, this is science experiment gone. Like, this is, how did we not notice this gone? This is like, boys, look at this. It's so awful. I can't help but show you how awful it is before I put it in the trash. Everything, everything on this earth spoils, perishes, and fades. Cars. Right now, we're driving on these uh, these roads that have had this snow and ice And in this part of the country, um, with with what they use to treat the roads to try to get that ice and snow to go away, your cars right now out in the parking lot are in a present state of rotting because of what's going on. I mean, there is a there is a reaction happening on the underside, on the undercarriage of your car, even as we speak. Right. I remember when we moved here. And I, my truck was really starting to rust out like every other truck in Indiana right around the wheel wells. It was way too soon to be doing it, I thought. And I was kind of like embarrassed, like, man, I'm getting this rust and it shouldn't be doing this right now. And, you know, uh, moved from Washington State. They don't even have salt out there. They just put studs on your tires and say, figure it out. You know, and that's what you do. And I come here and I was just hating it and thinking, man, I'm going to need to trade the truck and need to get rid of it. It's kind of embarrassing. And now it's kind of like a source of pride because I just fit in with everybody else around here with the rusty wheel wells. I mean, it's just, it's, there was a day when I bought it and it looked good, but it spoils, it fades, it wears out. Your house is the same. Fashion is the same. 
Maybe one of my favorite examples. I saw this picture the other day of the before and after or the now and then of Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was this picture of physical fitness, right? Right? Mr. Olympia, seven times over. Only two people have ever won more than him. But listen, things sag and flab and they get close. We return to the earth in more ways than we would like to admit as we age. And what was once tone and taut and muscular is now getting, well, less tone. We spoil. We f- everything on this earth fades away, spoils and perishes. Peter says, but God's promise and his inheritance that you are guaranteed in Christ will never fade. It will never fade. Before you think that that inheritance may not be all that it's cracked up to be, I'll remind you of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 about that inheritance. He said, no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no mind has ever conceived what God has in store for those who loved him. And it'll never perish. It'll never fade. It'll never spoil. That's why when you're in hard times, I mean hard times, bone crushing, soul crushing, suffering, that you can, as Peter says in verse six, in all this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief In all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. How do you hold on to your faith when everything around you is melting down, when the world around you is so acidic and it's wanting to take your spiritual soul from you? You do so by remembering your identity and your inheritance is secure. It cannot be taken from you, and you cannot lose it. This, this chapter and this book, for that matter, raise up a question from the reader to ask of themselves, where do I find my primary identity? Do I find my primary identity in God, in God's family, or do I find my primary identity in the world? See, the world gives us all kinds of different ways to identify ourselves through our money, through our achievement, through through our uh, skill or through our ability. Every one of you has had moments in your life, you may be in one right now, where you are choosing to identify yourself primarily through a worldly construct. Politics is another one. Some of you are primarily identifying yourself through the political frame of reference. This question is asking us to consider there is a primary identity in Christ that trumps all other identities, all other identities. Where is your primary identity? Our identity when it's in Christ is one that can never be lost. I heard this story about a guy named Stephen Thomas. He's out in San Francisco. He's a programmer. And in the early, early days of Bitcoin, I mean, when it was like super duper cheap to grab a hold of, he get, grabbed a bunch of it up, kind of forgot. He got it locked uh, away into a um, password encryption type place uh, or device called Iron Key. And it, it protects all of your passwords and all your data that you, that you lock in it. And, and the deal is, is that you, you have 10 attempts if you forget your password. You only have 10 attempts to log in. And, and if you don't get it in these 10 attempts, everything that you have sealed and secured uh, digitally is gone and no one is ever, ever, ever going to get access to it. This guy has 7,000 Bitcoins, okay? So putting in today's number, I mean, as of today, is like $41,000 per Bitcoin today. That's $287 million, 
He's messed up eight times trying to log in. He has two times left. Two logins left before he loses $287 million. And there is no one or no how. There's no, there's no IT guy that you can call and go, hey, I forgot my password. That's what I do. When I get locked out of something here at church, call the IT guy. Call Jason. Help me. Help me, man. And he's on the other end of the phone. He fixes something, you know, and tells me what my new password is. Thank you. You can't, he can't fix this. Some of you guys who are not so keen on the crypto stuff are going, this is why I don't want to do that. This is why. This is why. That makes me nervous. He was interviewed about this conversation and asked what he's doing. He says, I just lay in bed and think about it. And I thought, you know what? That's an honest answer. Because wouldn't you? Wouldn't you just sit there and lay every night awake in bed? Just exasperated that you might throw away $287 million because you can't remember your password. Truth is, is it's believed up to 20% of Bitcoin is lost, never to be recovered. 20% of the value that's out there and is in this, people are in the same boat. This is sad. It's a sad reality. It's a sad story. And it stands in stark contrast to what Peter just said about the inheritance that we have in Christ. There isn't a forgotten password scenario. You can't lose it. You can't miss out on it. It's an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Here's a couple of the big themes in this book that we're going to grab a hold of over the next several weeks. Number one, in Christ, your identity and your inheritance is secure even when your circumstances are not. There's a temptation to try to make the spiritual reality and our earthly realities congruent. And when they are not, we tend to think things are off and are never, ever going to get recalibrated. Peter's here to remind us the world and the kingdom of God do not fit together. So just because the world stuff isn't working right does not mean the, the, the kingdom stuff is not still stable and secure. There's nothing ambiguous about Peter's language. There's nothing ambiguous about God's language about your identity or your inheritance in Christ. The cross has demonstrated that God has already signed the document. You have it in your hand if you have placed your faith in Jesus. You're going to get what Peter talked about, the new birth, the living hope, the resurrection power. People can contest wills on earth. It happens all the time. But you can't contest with God. He's written this will in his own blood. And if your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life because you have declared Jesus as Lord of your life, your identity and your security and your inheritance will never spoil, fade, or perish. That's why when life melts down and when circumstances just are hard, bone-crushing, soul-crushing circumstances, we can still hold on to hope Because nobody can steal our identity or our inheritance from God away from us. Not only that, we get glimpses in today of what our full inheritance is going to be. We may not get it and feel it all, but we're getting test drives. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I've come that they would have life and life to the full. He's talking about life after death for one, eternal life. But he's talking about on this earth now, in the here and now. That there is a fullness, like a test drive. Imagine there's a new model of a car that's yet to be released, but you're getting a chance to drive it ahead of time. That's what it's like. That's what it's like as a follower of Jesus. We're experiencing test drives in advance of the official release. Here's what this means then. Our identity, our inheritance is secure. Circumstances can be melting down. But with the tension of those two realities happen, this is practically what's going on. That while your inheritance is being kept for you, you are being kept for your inheritance. God is going to keep working on you. He is going to keep shaping you. He's going to keep refining you. He's going to keep moving you down the road towards maturity, especially when you suffer. Let's keep in mind, the suffering that Peter is talking about is not I stub my toe suffering. All right? He's talking about the suffering you experience because of your faith. Because of Jesus, the world hates you. Maybe a boss or a neighbor or a family member. Maybe it's a financial ruin that that is connected to it. God's got to work that he wants to do in you. 
and the picture that is painted. And it's not just here. It's other places in the Bible. It's a common metaphor. It's that of gold refinement. We refine gold a little bit differently today, but the ancients had a process that they would work through. It took several steps to get through. And, and even though we can do it better and refine things more purely today, they were able to get it pretty far down the road, 93% pure. It would start with finding the gold, usually in a riverbed. And after finding it, they would clean it up, clean all the dirt and deposits and sediment on it. Then they would crush it, break it down, and then they would heat it up. I mean, for days, they would heat it up. They'd put it into a, a pot of some kind, and they would heat this thing and heat this thing and heat this thing. And when it stopped smoking, when all the dross and the waste material had been burned out, then it was officially pure gold. Peter says, this is the process. This is the process of Christian maturity. This is the process of being strengthened through trials and strengthened through temptations. The process, the metaphor really sticks. God finds us. Where does he find us? In the mud. <laughs> he picks us out of that mud. He cleans us up. What, what happens when you put your life in, in God's hands and say, I'm not my own boss anymore. You're my own boss. He crushes you when you give him that opportunity. And if that wasn't enough, he then takes you, this reshaped version, and he puts you into the fire. Some of you are going through it right now. And whereas gold in the old days took five days, maybe you feel like it's been five years. And God's still refining. He's still working. He's still moving in your life. Sometimes when we go through these hardships, we start to doubt our faith. We start to wonder, do I have enough faith? Do, am, am, I, am, I, am I not faithful because I'm not as successful as I want to be? I mean, successfully like with sin, I keep screwing up. I keep making the same mistakes. I keep struggling over and over and over again. No, this is part of the refinement process. Sometimes we like to define faith as our faithfulness, but the truth is we are not the object of the faith. Jesus is, and it's his faithfulness that is sustaining us through it. Our job is to hold on, to hold on to hope, to hold on to Jesus, to hold on to that which has taken hold of us. Our identity and our inheritance is secure. That can't be taken from us if we have made Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. The world can melt down around us. The culture can continue to assail. But you and I have an opportunity to step out of that world and to identify primarily as followers of Jesus and as the family of God. Before Peter writes anything else in this book, he wants to make that known. That in the midst of our suffering, we can stand up and praise, and praise transports us to the throne room of God, no matter what our circumstances are. That even when everything around us is melting down, take hope and take heart. Your identity is secure. Your future is secure. God still is hanging on. He's still working with you. In fact, your suffering is isn't just something to endure, it has a purpose. You know, when you go to the hospital for a surgery, nobody wants to do that. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what I want to do? I want to have surgery today. But we do it because there's a promise of what's on the other side of that. We go through the inconvenience and we go through the pain and we go through that difficulty. Why? Because we know that on the other side of it, there's going to be health and healing and an enriched life that we're not experiencing at the moment. If you're going through the fire right now, know that your suffering has purpose. God is going to walk through this with you and you are being changed even right now. So as we come to this opportunity to take this text really work it through our lives and respond. I want to lay out a couple for you. One, 
with the assurance and the certainty that we have that if we have made Jesus Christ our Lord, He has been our Savior, that that never can be taken away. If you've never made that decision, I can't think of a better day than today to do so. To turn away from an old life lived for yourself and to put your life fully and completely in God's hands. To embrace what Jesus did for you on the cross, forgiving your sins, establishing a new reality for you, and to personally give your life to Him. If you want to talk about or take that step or pray about what that looks like for you, I'll be waiting in the back for you. Online, our hosts are reaching out right now, providing opportunities for you to respond. There's an inheritance there for you to claim. Don't wait another day to claim it. No lost passwords, no worry about whether you're going to be rejected. It's there for you. Receive it. Some of you, you're suffering right now and I want to encourage you and inspire you to renew your hope that God sees you. I think part of Peter writing this letter to this book, this, these Christians was to help them know, I see you in this suffering. I see the struggle that you're going through. I see this hardship. Don't lose heart. God's help is on the way. Lastly, I want to remind you what we said earlier. Praise may be your biggest ally in the hardest moments of your life. It might feel like the furthest thing from what you want to do, but it might be the closest thing to help, the healing and to peace, to lift up your eyes from the present circumstance, to look to the hills where our help comes from. Where does our help come from? To the Lord and to worship him in this moment and to let him speak to you through worship. Will you stand with me? Will you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we give our our lives and we respond to you in this moment knowing, God, that you, you want more for us than we even want for ourselves. We think we know what we want in life. We think that we understand, but you want even more. And so, God, in this moment of difficulty, perhaps, this moment of suffering, as we go through a fire, God, your truth is refining us. Your spirit is sustaining us. And God, we place our faith again in you. But whatever our next step is to you, help us to see what that is, to have the courage and boldness to respond. We love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.